grateful to be able to introduce our speaker today, uh, Tommy Rosen. He's an internationally renowned yoga teacher. He's the founder and CEO of Recovery 2.0. He's inter an internationally acclaimed author and addiction recovery expert who has spent the last three decades immersed in recovery and wellness. He holds advanced certifications in both Kundalini and Hatha Yoga and has 29 years of continuous recovery from addiction. It is incredibly amazing that we're, we have you here with us, Tommy. Thank you so much. So Tommy's going to dive into a little bit about his story and all the great things he's up to in the world today. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. And um, just massive love and greetings to everybody here. I want to just thank Angela so much for that beautiful centering practice. It does, just doesn't get, for me, it just, just doesn't get more exciting than that. You know, that's where the juice is. That's where the action is. And for me to understand that has taken an entire lifetime. So I'll begin by just saying that, you know, I identify as a person on the path of discovery and Sometimes I'll say I'm a person on the path of discovery in recovery. To me, it's all the same thing. Recovery is yoga. Movement from disconnection into connection. Movement from darkness into light. Movement from confusion to clarity. Movement from addiction to freedom. It's all the same process. That movement, that transformation that each of us is undergoing, we can refer to it as recovery, that's fine. We could refer to it as a religion, a spirituality, uh, uh, a path of becoming. We can call it recovery or yoga, or we call it anything. Just like we can choose our own higher power. I feel the important thing is to just recognize that we are human beings on this path because we've chosen chosen to be here. We've chosen to be on this path. We're choosing it right now. It's not thrust upon us by accident, but we are engaging with it because we've come to the enlightened moment of a bottom. And that's what each of us share. We share many things. One of them is we have known the feeling of being at a bottom. And that's a sacred place. And not everybody gets to visit that sacred place. It's very special. And what coming to a bottom allows you to do is, in that moment, to tell the truth. A bottom is nothing more than a moment when you're finally ready to tell the truth. And so each of us has been there. And we have seen our stories shattered upon the rocks <laughs> and it has been painful and difficult as we have had to adopt a new way of being in the world when we didn't know how to do that we only knew we couldn't go on the way we were going and something had to change but we didn't know yet how to bring that change into being and that is the path of recovery and it lasts precisely the rest of your life. So I'm on this path of discovery. And what that means for me is I'm committed to the present moment and to finding truth. Those two things, the present moment and truth. The reason I call it a path of discovery is because if you're truly in the present moment, you have absolutely no idea what's coming next. You can't predict it. You're in the unknown. It's only when you future trip that you are in the illusion of being able to predict what's about to come. Or if you're stuck in the past, based upon your history, your memory, you can say, ah, I can predict a future, but you will not be in the present moment. <clears throat> the present moment is truly the unknown. So to step into the present moment means, by definition, 
you are on a path of discovery. One moment to the next, one breath to the next. It takes great courage to do that because it's challenging, frightening, difficult to be in the present moment and to commit to stepping into the unknown moment to moment. There are many reasons why people turn to substances or other addictive behaviors. There's depression, which means that somebody had not found a way to express, so they became repressed and depressed. There's rage and anger that results. There's confusion and frustration. These are reasons why people turn to substance and addictive behaviors because the present moment to those people appear intolerable. So rather than step into the unknown, rather than be here now and feel and experience and learn and move through, it's a little bit thanks, but no thanks. It's saying to the universe, yes, but no, <laughs> not really. <laughs> I'd rather do this my way, thank you not so into this present moment stuff. For me, the reason that I turn to substances is now very clear. And I could sum it up for you in one word. Anxiety. Anxiety. So I was born into an argument. My mother and father were at it. And by the time I was one, they were divorced. So that first year of my life, I was born into an argument. And I believe that an infant is very aware of something being wrong. As I grew up, and that through my childhood, as a small child, and then later on in my adolescent years, what I can reflect to you is to tell you that the way that I knew myself was anxious, hyperactive. My way of dealing with anxiety in the early days was constant movement, never stop athletic sports, literally running through my house, like bouncing off the walls, a, a crazy, crazy, uh, an atrocious sugar-filled diet. So sugar. So the way that I look at it is I, baseline is anxiety. That's how I understand myself. I'm gonna do something to fix that problem. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach out to something and it really doesn't matter what it is. But I'm gonna reach out to something to relieve me of this anxiety. And I'm gonna get high. We'll call it just getting high, right? And then I'm gonna crash. And when I crash, I'm gonna return back to my baseline. And my baseline is anxiety. Just nod if you understand what I'm talking about. Okay. The challenge with this is this can repeat itself for a lifetime. Anxiety, reach out, get high, crash, return to anxiety. Reach out, get high, crash, return to anxiety. It doesn't matter that it was heroin or cocaine, alcohol, sex, uh, gambling, uh, technology, um, alcohol in all of its forms. It doesn't matter what the behavior is. It's just a behavior. It's just a behavior which helped you to navigate the core reason why the present moment was so uncomfortable for you. And for me, that was anxiety. Now, I didn't know that. I just bounced around, bounced around, and people would say, my God, you, you really never stop moving. When we just, my parents would say, you know, please calm down, sit down for a minute. I didn't have that ability. And so the challenge with this rhythm 
of reach out, get high, crash, return to anxiety is you never break through the anxiety. You never break out of that core condition. You never get to know yourself. You never get to enjoy a present moment. Never. That means for a lifetime, until this is faced, until this challenge is faced, for a lifetime, you're chasing. Always something. Always at chasing something, and the mind remains in a particular kind of loop. Avoid pain, recreate pleasure. Avoid pain, recreate pleasure. You could only know how to avoid pain or recreate pleasure by looking into your memory banks. This was painful, I don't wanna do it again. I wanna avoid that at all costs. Oh, that was pleasurable, let's repeat that experiment. I'm looking back, where am I? I'm in the past. Attached to memories, emotional and otherwise, which are propelling and compelling my behavior into certain things. And I'm repeating. Return to anxiety. The irony is that in stillness, the kind of stillness that Angela was just taking us through, in the practice of that, over time, the anxiety calms. And you didn't even need to figure out what the cause of the original anxiety was. Whatever that story was, oh, I was born into an argument. Okay. Well, I'm an adult now. I don't want that argument to be affecting me for the rest of my life. It wasn't even my argument. So the anxiety starts to dissipate. Before that, it's like an, an itch that you can never scratch. You're scratching at it, you can never get deep enough. And so you continue to chase, continue to chase, continue to chase. Chase what? Anything, everything. Chase something different than what is by any means necessary. Something different than what is by any means necessary. And that's so painful. And we never get to get to know who we are. What we could be. We're not on a path of discovery. We're on a path of stuckness. In a pattern that we don't fully understand. In memories that aren't completely accurate or true. Keeping us stuck in a force field of addiction. This is what we're up against, one day at a time. So to break out of that, at some point, we reached the bottom. Things got so bad that we couldn't go on anymore, even though we didn't know any other way. A lifetime of reaching out, getting high, crashing, and returning to baseline anxiety. Terrifying. The more you avoid the present moment, the more terrified you are of it. The more you crave the future, the more you crave something different, the more you go after, chase something else than what is, what is becomes terrifying. But it's not actually terrifying, it's just that your mind has created this massive story. If I stop moving, if I really slow down, if I put down these drugs and alcohol, if I stop acting out sexually, if I stop chasing something in this world, what would I be? Who would I be if I wasn't actually chasing anything? And for most people, that's a very scary thing. You think you want the ride to stop, but you really don't want the ride to stop. And so what happens when the ride really stops? You guys saw The Matrix. So you're, like in The Matrix, you're, you're, you're in the white room. 
the construct. You don't know what's coming down the pipe. All possibility, all potential. But there's nothing there yet. You're in this interesting state of limbo. For me, that took place in treatment. Drug and alcohol treatment. Hazelden, went to Hazelden in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, a new construct came in for me. A new way of being. At first, all it was, the, for a number of years of my recovery, all it really was was exercise, go to meetings, speak to your sponsor, and then eventually, finally, do the steps. I, got, I stayed sober for a year after treatment. I relapsed for a year, and then I got sober for the last time on June uh, 23rd, 1991. So this year I'll be 30 years, which is exciting for me. I'm going to make a big celebration out of that. But those two years of get sober, then relapse, and then finally get sober, those two years were floaty, kind of floaty years. I haven't really yet established myself in recovery. Yes, I'm going to meetings. And the way I, I looked at my recovery at that time was, here's my life. I'm going to leave my life. I'm going to go over here to a meeting. I'm going to check the box when we're done with the meeting, and then I'll return to my life. And that's a very compartmentalized way to look at things. My life is not separate from anything that I do, or anything that I do is not separate from my life. Once recovery became integrated into my life as something that, like, I would follow this path, and this path would lead me to wonderful places, and I would experience great challenge along the way as well. Once that became a part of my life, then I started to get momentum. This being a part of my life, I could do things like call my sponsor every day. Why? Because that's what I do. This is a part of my life. Get to a meeting every day. Why would you do that? Because I get to connect with other people on the same path as me. Read the book. Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous basic, basic text or Adult Children of Alcoholics, The Red Book, or any of them. Why would I read that text? Because it's a sacred spiritual text that supports me in a movement forward where? Into connection, union, love, presence. It is daily breaking me out of my rhythm of this nonsense. I'm breaking out of my routine of I'm anxious, get high, crash, return to anxious. No, not allowed to do that anymore. Now it's I'm anxious. Let me call somebody and tell them about it. Let me get to a meeting and learn about other people's anxiety and realize, oh, this isn't just me. We have this thing together. And the best news, there's a way through that where you don't have to repeat this for the rest of your life. And then after getting the massive transformation that I was looking for through the 12 steps, I should just quickly comment on that. And then, and then uh, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll, I'll try to, to, to wrap it up. I could go a long, long time. Uh, so, um, okay. So, we talk a lot about the promises as they're laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or many other texts, the promises. There are theoretically sort of 12 of them. But for me, there was only one. There was only one thing I was after. Make it stop. Please make it stop. Now, what did I mean by that? I didn't mean I don't want to think anymore. What I meant was I want the war inside of me to end. I want the war to end. I don't want to be in conflict with myself anymore. I feel like I'm in conflict all the time in early recovery. Why? One part of me really knows this is the right place to be. I'm in the right place. And I know this is leading to a good thing, even though it's uncomfortable. The other part of me wants to use drugs and alcohol, period. There's one fight. That's one of many fights.
but I want that fight to be over. I don't want to be thinking for the rest of my life, will I get high today? Should I get high today? Maybe just going through it in my mind. I don't want to be in that game anymore. Make it stop. And the people around me said, it will stop. It will stop. But you won't know when it happens. You can't predict when this is going to happen. <clears throat> you just have to do it. You got to keep coming back. You got to do the things we're asking you to do. Open yourself up to be helpful to other people. And it will happen for you. And after I got through my ninth step, which is where they talk about the promises, lo and behold, I woke up one day and I could not remember the last time I thought about using drugs and alcohol. Just couldn't remember. And I all of a sudden realized that I was free from that. And in, from that moment, which must have been about nine months into my recovery, sometime in my first year, but after, after completing through the ninth step, and then I went on to, to take a, a many, 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 many people through the steps over the years. And um, it served me in the biggest way. And I've never, ever, in 29 years, thought about using drugs and alcohol. Just hasn't ever come back. Now, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> that war, you know, it's done. One day at a time, it's finished. But there would be other wars. <laughs> there would be many, 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 many other wars. You know, anger, greed, judgment, lust, uh, self-centeredness. You know, all the things about being human were not just done because I was able to be freed from drug and alcohol addiction. That's when the work began for me. And then step in yoga. So the 12 steps, foundation. Laid the foundation of my life. A way to be rigorously honest, um, a way to deal with resentment as it arises, a way to, a willingness always to help, a willingness always to apologize and to, to clean up messes that I make even now in my life. Those principles never stop being valid. Those are spiritual principles. They're beyond a human being. They're beyond us. That's like a decision. I live that way now because of the 12 steps, because they're embedded into the cells of my body. They're embedded into my DNA. And so people would say, well, do you work the steps? It's like every second. It's happening right now. Of course. Oh, what are you doing? I'm like, you're watching, you're looking at it. <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily about reading a book and, and doing writing, although that's part of it sometimes. <laughs> but yoga, the physical practice of yoga, breath work, kriya, that's a very big word, kriya, K-R-I-Y-A, kriya, kriya, evolutionary right action. Evolutionary right action. Doing something that leads to your evolution. That's every day. That's an everyday thing for me. And that means powerful practices, physical, getting deep into this body, detoxifying, sweating, breath work. Very intense sometimes, very mellow other times. Deep meditation. Super silent, super still, super internal. Relating to myself beyond anxiety, beyond my stories, beyond all the things I tell myself about what I think is and what I think I am and what I think this body is. My dad used to say to me, 
He was at the end of his life. He was an older man. He was not in particularly good shape. And he'd say, I can't begin to describe to you what happens when I look in the mirror. He'd say, how did this happen? How did this happen to me? Like I'm here, like here, I'm like six, I'm a 16 year old boy, he'd tell me. He's like, I was 16 a minute ago, he would tell me. And I look and I, oh, how did this happen? And, and what he was sharing with me was very real wisdom about the eternal nature of consciousness, which has no age and no time, and his body, which is going to decay and eventually dissolve and become something else. And he was talking to me about that at the end of his life. And I'm looking at myself on screen here right with you right now, and I'm like, how did this happen? Jesus, I had black hair a second ago, didn't I? What? what? Wow, I had a gray beard? Fuck, we're going to shave that thing off later today. <laughs> you know, it, that's ego. That's ego not understanding that this body is not you. You have to go deeper than that, and you have to understand that this body is going, but the part of you that matters the most isn't, and that's the part that you want to be connecting with on a daily basis. And that's the part of you that's connected to higher power that runs through you. As you see it, not as I see it, as you relate to it. So yoga came into the picture and helped me to overcome one by one, day by day, one day at a time, these other addictions, these other tendencies to act out in this way or another way. And yoga really helped me to get a deeper detoxification. And I, I don't want to just end on this note. The heroin addict has to physically detox off of heroin in order to begin the process that we're talking about. Until that person is detoxed, they're unable to move forward. There's a, there's a stuckness there that is physical, very gross in nature. But after that person detoxes off of heroin and they move along the path of discovery, they're going to have many, 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 many more detoxes. Each one more subtle, more subtle, more subtle, more gentle, more subtle than the next. So they'll, they'll go through an emotional detox. Many. Maybe they're holding some grief in their body and they are not aware of it. Talk about an itch that you can't scratch. So they're holding grief in the body and they're not aware of it. And what happens is they become aware of it through a practice. And then it's in their face and, and they can see it. And this is the next lesson plan for them. They have to work on that because why? It's showed up in the present moment and they can't avoid it and look for something else. It's like, no, no, this is here now. I'm on the path of discovery. This is what showed up. My response ability, my response ability is here now. Have to do that. And then you process this and that's a deeper detox. So the way I'm looking at recovery these days is as a movement from the very gross all the way down to the very subtle. Down to the very subtle. At first, when I got sober, I liked adventure. I wanted things with impact. I want impact because that's what my nervous system is attuned to. But as I go down the road, bit by bit, and my teacher told me, Tommy, you need to become thrilled by the subtle. You need to become thrilled by the subtle. Thrilled by the subtle, which is why I said at the beginning, after Angela's um, centering practice for us, that's where the action is. I meant it. That is where the action is if you're attuned to that. And then you become thrilled just by closing your eyes, relating to yourself and taking a deep breath. And everything that you need you recognize everything that you need is here and now. Everything you need is here and now. Everything you need is here and now. 
and you'll never need anything else except the here and the now. And if you stay there and work with the discomfort, lean into it, then you will find yourself in a kind of life that has no description. You can't describe it. You're in the flow of the entire universe. And there's no addiction there. And each day, you can be knocked off your center. Even though the day before you were in the flow of the universe, you still have to realize. The next day, you could be knocked flat on your ass. That's why we always come back to, we can access the flow of the universe, but we can only do it one day at a time. And we have to keep doing it. We have to stay in our practice, stay in our practice, stay in our practice. And that's the work that we do at Recovery 2.0. And, uh, and it's joyful and hopeful and effective. And I will end on that note. Thank you so much. Wow, man, that was incredible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tommy. I could deeply relate. And I know that so many people in this meeting could. Um, a lot of different things came up for me. One was uh, I was told that I had ADD um, and that process that you showed with your hands was literally all it was. You know, I was just trying to get out of the moment. Um, but one of the questions I have for you is um, because our group, we, we like try to help anybody who has like a struggle with fear, anger, um, shame, pain, guilt, all those like self emotions that really hurt. Um, talked about a bottom you know I think I like I say this all the time but I'm so so grateful that I went through addiction and I went through alcoholism because it allowed me to hit that bottom I look around and there's people that are struggling deeply but they don't have the addiction so they might not hit that bottom so it becomes a it's like I I feel bad and I want to um also give them a program you know of uh like, cause we were able to get that baseline, you know, of that incredible principles of the 12 steps. But I'd say um, not, it's not easy for everybody else because they don't hit that bottom. And then also there's not a 12 step necessarily that's open to everybody, I guess. So I'm kind of curious your thoughts on that. How do you hold the space in your life for those people that you kind of know are struggling, but it's not bad enough yet where they want to make drastic change, but you know, it's, it's harming them, um, mm. you know? Yes, uh, it's a wonderful question, and I, I so appreciate it. And um, I've come to understand that you know those people who are in the in the middle, mm. they they um, they're struggling, mm. and they haven't found their way yet. Maybe mm. don't have a path and a community, a set of principles to follow. Right. And the thought is like the thought that has been put in our head through 12 step land is unless you reach a bottom, it'll be very difficult to pick up a new set of principles and practices. And I have not found that to be completely true. I've actually found a lot of people who have not had to hit the kind of bottoms that many of us have had to hit but who are actually teachable. And so I, I think it comes down more to just humility, humility and being teachable than it does. You have to hit a certain bottom before you could like have the gift of a program. And we also have to remember that 12 steps is not the only program that can carry a person forward. Many people will not ever go there, but that doesn't mean they won't reach their destiny and their fulfillment in this life. Everybody's a beginner to their next step. Okay, so whoever's here in the room, like whatever the next thing is that you're striving for, that you desire to manifest, that you would like to see happen for yourself or uh, the, next, the next thing that's coming for you in, in your level of understanding or awareness, you have no idea what that is. You're a beginner to that next step. I completely have no idea 
what my next step is going to look like because I haven't been there yet. Everybody's that beginner. Everybody is that beginner. So what we need is, number one, just the sm a smidgen of, of humility. Humility being, you know, let's just say open-minded, open-hearted. There's, there's an actual, you know, there's an incredible teaching. Um, I'm not even going to say in Christianity. I'll just say there's an incredible teaching that Jesus gave. Okay? Jesus Christ, the master, human being who had mastered his mind, yeah? That guy said, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth, which in language, updated language, just simply means the meek, those of open mind and open heart, the meek, those of open mind and open heart, would inherit the earth, the earth, the teaching. Those who have an open mind and open heart will be able to receive the teaching. That's all. In the book, it says, contempt prior to investigation. If you close your mind before you even look at something, then you are not teachable. The teaching will go right over your head. It will bounce right off of your heart. And, and you will miss it. So it's not so much that a person reaches a bottom, but it is, it is that they have to be teachable. And, they, and when I encounter people who are not teachable, because their, their heart and their mind is just so full with their own ideas, I just say a little blessing to them. You know, like, and not like there's even anything wrong with them. I just say, you know, bless you in, in your way. You know, it's none of my business. And my teacher told me this. He said, you know, you can help a few people. You help the people that ask you to help them. Or you help the people that show up. If you're going to be a yoga teacher, for example, if you, if you come into my room, you showed up. And so I can present ideas to you. <clears throat> but anybody else, just bless them and mean it. Like, I wish you fulfillment at every level, in every way in your life. That's a good blessing. So that's it. And then the rest of it, it's none of my business. And that's the other, that's a great mantra. Four words, none of my business. And I have had to learn that the hard way and poke my nose into someone else's business and it has never gone well for me, especially my family. You know what my family is not looking for? Advice from me. Nobody. There's zero people there looking for my advice. <laughs> we have a long history. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. No, thank you, Tom, so much. That that was deeply profound. And uh, it freed me a little bit of, of a little stress I had been holding in that regard. So thank you so much, Tommy. <laughs> I, see, uh, I see Joe with his hand up. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Joe uh, hire off a question here. Thank you, Kyle. Tommy, that was amazing, man. Uh, I love the way that you've made something that I think is on most people's mind as just being a human and you you articulated it in a way that made it uh, very, very digestible. It was just, just absolutely amazing. Something that I noticed, which I love that you spoke on is, uh, is like stages. Because uh, I recently discovered myself personally, my addiction to knowing like my addiction to knowing to what's coming up next. I also discovered a, a deep seated rageaholic in myself that if things aren't going in those knowing ways, then the addiction goes to let's get as angry as I can. And I, and I didn't even realize that I was doing it, but I would get so f frustrated in hopes that that higher power would see like you've pissed me off. And that's, I didn't even realize that's how I was doing it until I sat quiet enough to do that. Mm -hmm. um, your ability to articulate the idea that this is a, a stage based thing where you can walk down a beaten path and wear out its resources and get to a point where you realize, oh, no, I have to beat a new path. And the anxiety of thinking of beating the new path can be something that just keeps you on that on, you know, that already worn out path 
just suck trying to like scrounge up resources. Mm. So to Kyle's point, you know, I think people even that don't get maybe don't have a substance addiction. I mean, our brain is releasing chemicals that we can get addicted to. And I think for people who are maybe getting to that place where they may not have a substance, but they've worn that beaten path of just like for myself, like wanting to know, and you just, you sop up all the resources. And after a while that becomes your bottom. Like you get sick and tired of like trying to figure out how to know what's going to come up next. And you just go, you know, like, how am I going to know what's going to come up next? And in that, I like you're, <laughs> spot on man your clarity of hitting like that frightening that feeling of just fright of the present moment and that's something that i've discovered that's like that's my thing for this year is to really embrace and just be ecstatic about the, the present moment and the unknowing of it so mm. it was not so much as a question just as a just a thank you man to clarify i love people who can clarify stuff and that was amazing thank you tommy thank you thank you joe uh, I, I love the mystery. I love the mystery. And I like to, uh, you know, uh, I like to honor the mystery. And uh, there's something for me, there's something cool about not knowing now. Like, wow, what a mystery. Woo. What's going to happen? You know, it's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I'm really, uh, I've come to understand uh, at a deeper level that it's, it's good just to be in the mystery. Hmm. You know, appreciate what you said very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I see uh, Gina with a hand up. So go ahead, Gina, whenever you're ready. Hi, am I unmuted? Yeah. I don't even know what I want to say. I just, I needed to say how much I appreciate everything you had to say, Tommy. Um, I'm coming up on seven months clean and I'm on a journey that's like just so amazing, like being a part of this group and everything and everything you had to say, I connected to. And it was just so beautiful the way you described addiction mm -hmm. and the process of, um, your, of recovery in general. It was so clear and so awesome. And I want everybody that's an addict, alcoholic, whatever, to hear it. Like mm -hmm. literally everyone I know. Um, I, when you said, um, I'll end, I was like, I don't want you to end. keep talking. <laughs> um, and I will be buying your book. Um, I also, I guess if I'm going to ask a question, I don't practice yoga and it's something that's, I'm always like, Oh, that's what I need to do. That's what I need to do. And I never, I don't even know where to start, especially with COVID right now. And I guess if you could give me some advice there, is it literally just going to a beginner's class? I mean, I, I guess that's my question. Okay. Thank you so much. So I, I really do want to emphasize for you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on seven months for God's sakes. I mean, that's just incredible. Uh, Thank you. I, it's just incredible. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. I'm so delighted for you. Um, down to the core. Yeah. It's just so cool. Um, uh, so I, I do believe that you are practicing yoga right now. I do believe that. I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And I'll get to what you mean. But I do believe, and, I, and you will come hopefully to find out, you are absolutely a yogi. You're a yogini. <laughs> and you're doing it. You're doing it already. So if you want to practice physical yoga, well, there are just endless ways to do that. Um, I mean, I could give you a thousand online sites. Um, in our membership, Recovery 2.0, it's less than a dollar a day. We have 20 live events a month. Oh, wow. We have 10 yoga, live yoga classes a month, plus you have access to a library of over 200 yoga classes. So any time of the day or night, you can tune in and you can practice physical yoga. So our membership is free for the first, I think it's seven days or 14 days, I can't even remember. But come and join for a week for free and just dig in and see, see if it uh, resonates for you. It's just um, r20.com forward slash join. And there's, as I said, there's, it's just free for that first week or two. And so have an experience, do a class. Uh, I teach on Wednesday morning live. 
7.30 a.m. Pacific time, come to my class. It doesn't matter if you've never practiced or been on a mat before. Just come to class. You will get it. Trust me, it's accessible. So that's one, one solution for you. Um, there are so many online yoga services now, so you can, you can dig in. You can just dig in. Um, and then there's, you know, if you get into it and you really enjoy it, there's trainings and workshops and immersions and all kinds of stuff you can do. But it just, again, it's one day at a time. Just start with a practice uh, and, and do, do one practice this week. Just, just do your first yoga practice, get a mat or get a towel, you know, get whatever and, and just sit there and just go through the motions uh, that the teacher is taking you through. And if your experience is anything like mine, you will feel something amazing happening in your physical frame. Really amazing. And, um, and then let me know how it goes. Thanks. I'd, I'd be curious to hear from you. Yeah. I'll totally let you know how it goes. I okay. appreciate the um, one day at a time. And even if I just do it once a week, because yeah. of course I want to do it eight times a day to get it right. But just thank do it you. Once. Yeah. <laughs> one, one time this week is a good goal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Gina. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Anyone? Uh, Joey. 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 Oh, Joe's here. Oh, awesome. Uh, Joe? Oh, Joey. There we go. Joey, go ahead, brother. Can you hear me? Yeah, buddy. Good seeing you. Awesome. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you so much, um, Tommy. That Your story was awesome. Uh, I just listened to it, went through, like Kyle said, you know, went through so many similarities from, you know, I my birth father left me when I was at two, when I was two weeks old. Um, you know, I, I've had an entire, had the story I told myself my entire life, um, uh, you know, that I wasn't good enough, that I didn't deserve the good things in life that come to me, always working, always fighting, always pushing to get more, you know, but coming up short, why, why wasn't it working? Why, why can't I have what other people have, um, you know, I, I filled my life with alcohol, with drugs. Um, I was, you know, diagnosed with everything and anything on medications. You know, I, I was on Adderall for, what, seven, eight years up until this past November. And, you know, like you said, just the whole, the energy, the bouncing just can't stop. I didn't know why I couldn't just slow down and live in that moment. Um, you know, and I, I know for me, I had just about a year ago today, almost, uh, this time last year, I, I hit my bottom that right before COVID everything, we, I think we were down to $200 left in our bank account for my wife and me with child support, rent, everything coming up in like a week. And I was, I was at that point, my job, I was a door-to-door -door salesman. And the day before kind of my awakening, I was, I went out for a jog and I blew my knee out. And I woke up that next day, just, I couldn't even move. I had to hobble to the couch and all I could do was just meditate and kind of sit there and think, what the shit am I going to do? I mean, I'm just terrified. And at that moment, <clears throat> I was given a vision. I was told just to let go, just to stop fighting it. And the moment I did, it was, it was so something beautiful, something amazing happened within me. And from that moment, it was like, everything just became clear. Everything just said to me, the universe spoke and said, it's all good. Trust in me, trust in God trust in this plan and stop worrying. And I did that. And it just completely changed everything. My entire life since then has been so amazing. Um, but what, what I've done, 
I know for me, I've, I've done so much work over the last year, the last six months particular, but it, it, you were talking about your story. You know, my question would be, because uh, I, I did a lot of the same work, it sounds like. I went in, I rewrote my story. <clears throat> and that's for another time. I'll, I'd love to share it, but I rewrote my entire story. And I'm no longer the person. I mean, I, I, I changed my DNA, basically. I rewrote my entire past. And <clears throat> I changed the story that I'd been telling myself. So what was it? What did you do? specifically how was it that you went in and you wrote rewrote your story how did you change all of that hatred all of that fear all of the pain the anxiety that you spoke of uh what was the one thing or i guess there's probably a lot of things but what was the one thing you can specifically say you went in on and allowed you to rewrite that story of yourself into who you are now if, if there was a one thing you know? yeah Thanks, Joey. Um, congratulations on what you shared. Sounds amazing. And uh, that's real. So great, great, great work and, and, and the results come, you know. Um, addiction works on a human being at four levels. Uh, the mind, the body, the spirit, and in our relationship with time time itself. So the question is, what can combat and help overcome or transcend addiction at each of those four levels? And it's not one thing. Therapy, talk therapy, processes like what you described as, as literally rewriting your history. Um, uh, psychological processes, very, very important. Very, very, very important. And I'm really, I've, I've been so fortunate to have wise therapists throughout my life, my recovery in particular. So it helps with the psychological piece, the mind piece, also meditation. Meditation, <clears throat> helping to center and calm and quiet the mind helping me to move beyond the mind and get to more of a consciousness rather than be driven around by my thoughts. The body piece is something not really addressed in the 12 steps. So the body piece has to come from somewhere else. Um, sweating, detoxing in that way, moving in certain ways. Uh, there's nothing like yoga for getting into a very deep, deep, penetrating down to the cellular molecular level than the practice of yoga. So to be able to transform the things that addiction has done to this body at the level of the brain, the nervous system, we're talking about the physical body, the brain, the nervous system, the endocrine system, and the muscles and the tissues and the skeleton of this body need help from the damage and from the tilting that addiction is put on it. And then that spiritual piece of the longing each of us has to belong, to be engaged in the world in a meaningful, purpose-filled way, to be connected to something greater than ourselves. Um, and then time relating to the present moment. We'll just leave it at that for now. So those four dimensions have to be addressed. So for me, the 12 steps, therapy, and yoga covered it all. The yoga, I want to say, was so profound and so deep, because I've gone deep into it, that it changed my subconscious mind through the practices in a way that talk therapy could never do. Talk therapy, important. And that hits on certain of the key points. Yoga, is digging into that subconscious mind, getting into that into the, the cellular level and cleaning that shit out in a way that talk therapy can't do. So a person could be in th talk therapy and be still be in their story 30 years later. And you, that's the thing when you go to a meeting and you hear somebody share their story 
and you can tell they're still gripped in their story. It's still painful to them in this moment as if it's still going on. But it isn't going on like what you said. You rewrote your story. You were able to transcend the old stories. And so that process is amazing. And I encourage the physical, deep physical yogic work to really complement that unbelievable transformation you've already had. And I, that, that for me is, is what, what really has made the difference, is it's the combination <clears throat> of things. And uh, as I wrote in my book, it's the kitchen sink method. And, and also, it's also bio-individual, meaning I am different than you. I come from a different family, genealogy. I've had different experiences. I've eaten different foods. I've watched different movies and different things. And so what's right for me isn't necessarily going to be right for somebody else. But I strongly suggest people try and have a direct experience for, of their own, of, of yoga and therapy and 12-step work over a period of years, uh, one day at a time has just opened up the most incredible portals. I'll just leave it at that. Has just opened up the most incredible portals in the universe. And I like those portals. I've always wanted to go there. And it turned out that I didn't need drugs and alcohol to get there at all. They were actually getting in the way. Um, so now the, the real portals have started to open. New possibilities present themselves. And, uh, a good time is had by all. <laughs> it's awesome. Hey, can I, do I have time to ask one follow-up on that? Go ahead, Joey. Yeah, uh, this is something, you said something, and I had this question, literally, I was talking with my wife, I think a week or two ago on this, the question she had. And the idea is we are what we become. We are what we tell ourselves we are, right? Mm -hmm. We imagine in our minds who we are and what we are and our subconscious goes to work at that point how how do you relate uh aa because I, I used to go to aa years ago um but how do you relate the visual identity or you know the identity that we give ourselves each and every day of the person we're wanting to become how does that for you affect when you go to aa and obviously Hello, my name is Tommy. I'm an alcoholic. You know, everybody has to lead off with that initial, I am an alcoholic. Is there, is that good? Is that bad in your opinion? Because I feel like this is what my wife and I were discussing. It's like, well, the, isn't that reinforcing who you are, you know, your belief of who you are every time you say, I am an alcoholic? 30 years later, that's still within you. But if you're trying to change that story, is there another way to change it other than continuing to, con to, it's almost like you're trapping yourself in this, I am an alcoholic. And you said how some people haven't gotten over their story and they just are still there 20 years down the road saying the same story. You know, is, is there a way to change that or to help getting ourselves connecting with the I am within us, but taking that idea of I'm an alcoholic, if you're wanting to rewrite your story, how do you remove that aspect of it, I guess? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I wrote a whole book about that. So check that out. <laughs> Recovery 2.0. Uh, so I'll answer your question uh, happily. And, uh, and I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> The answer is it depends. Um, there is a moment in certain people's lives where it could be valuable for them to, to refer to themselves in that way. At a certain stage of development, it might be important for that person to identify in that way. Also important for them to identify, to be a part of a group. And the very same reasons why it's important at a certain point, later on, cease to be true. We're on an evolutionary path. 
or we're not. Our language will naturally change as we move along an evolutionary path. The reason I don't refer to myself as an addict or alcoholic is because it's simply not true for me. But it's not a reflection or even a suggestion to anybody else. For me, that designation simply is no longer true. Does that now mean that I can go out and smoke pot and drink alcohol and I'll have, you know, my life won't end up in the toilet? Really the wrong question. I can't imagine a life where those things are a part of it. One day at a time. I don't have that affliction. I am a human. Every day I have another opportunity to rise above or get stuck in. Every day. My language reflects my current level of awareness. I'm on a path of discovery in recovery. Yes, there are meetings I'll go to where it goes around the room very quickly, rapid fire. It's like Johnny alcoholic, Deborah alcoholic, Julie alcoholic, Michael alcoholic. And it comes around to me and I'm just like, oh God, let's see. Uh, Tommy on a path of discovery in recovery. <laughs> so what I do is I just say, Tommy alcoholic. And I smile to myself and I know that for me, I'm doing that out of respect and not to be disruptive and not to have to explain myself or to appear different to people. But in my heart of hearts, I simply know that that designation is no longer true for me. And it's okay. I'm not reinforcing anything. I'm not dragging myself down into the muck of addiction because I've said it at some meeting, you know, Tommy addict. I've transcended that. As a yogi, I can say those words and understand my intention is not, <laughs> not there. It's okay. And I also recognize I really don't want to disrupt a meeting. I don't want to call out undue attention to myself. And I can be, I can sort of play in. I can sort of play into the pack and see if I can give something positive to that meeting and then step away without feeling like I'm better than anybody or worse than anybody. I'm just me. And with all of my joys and all of my challenges, all of my strengths and all of my flaws, just like everybody else. I don't need anybody to agree with me. And I'm not trying to tell anybody how they ought to be. So I'm able to transcend the language of that because in my own heart, I understand on, at Recovery 2.0 meetings, and by the way, we have, I guess, 40 meetings a week now. At our meetings, like your meeting, we refer to ourselves as people on a path of discovery just because it's inclusive of anybody. Everybody wants to be on a path of discovery. Everyone I've ever met, like if you said to somebody, oh, you don't like discovery in your life? They'd be like, of course I like discovery in my life. Of course I'm on a path of discovery. You'd be offended if, if somebody suggested that you weren't, you know, in discovery. So we all want to be a part of that. But I'll say this last piece. At some point, we're, we're coming to the truth each of us in our own way. We're coming to the truth. And when you touch upon the truth, the way you got there no longer matters at all. You can touch and reach the truth, and I mean capital T, through infinite variations, infinite. You can get there through Christianity, you can get there through Judaism. You can get there through Islam. You can get there through Sikhism. You can get there through Buddhism. You can get there from Hinduism. You can get there through every kind of spirituality on the planet Earth. You can get there as an atheist. You can get there as an agnostic. You can get there as anything. 
Once you get there, however you got there, no longer matters at all. Because the truth was there before Christianity. The truth was there before Judaism. The truth was there before Islam. The truth was there before Alcoholics Anonymous. The truth was there before Hinduism. The truth was there before everything. Because the truth was there before there was there. So when you touch that, it doesn't matter anymore. So our, our gripping onto, oh, I'm, I'm a 12-stepper. I'm like, okay. I, I hope it gets you to the truth, and then you can be a little bit less intense about being a 12-stepper. You know, I'm a intense, I'm a devout Christian. Okay, cool. <laughs> I want it to take you to the truth, and once you're there, then you can just ease up a bit. We all are trying to get to the same place. It doesn't matter how we get there. It doesn't matter. This is why God of your understanding. God of your understanding. And, and if everybody just would leave everybody else alone with it already, give everyone a break. If you want to be in the 12-step room, gosh darn it, be there. If you want to call yourself an addict, I have no comment for you. If you're confused, then we can talk about it. If you're moving to where that language no longer works for you, then we can talk about it. But if you're okay with your path, I'm not here to tell you that it's wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? In fact, I'm here to celebrate you for finding a path that works for you. And then we can be, you know, a little bit more at peace with ourselves and with each other. And that's, that's what we need. We really, really need that just about now. So, anyway. Tommy, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much for all that wisdom you shared with us today. I, I can tell everyone's mind's blown. Um, I'm going to be joining Recovery 2.0, and I look forward to continuing this friendship. But what we do now is we close with a prayer. Um, so we dedicate the merit of this meeting to all those awakening at this precious time. May our efforts to better ourselves help shift the planetary consciousness from fear into love. May this energy ripple out into the world and awaken those with closed hearts, illuminate closed minds, and inspire all to live within the presence of compassion and generosity. Thanks again, Tommy. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Tommy. Thank you, everyone. So welcome. So welcome. Hope to see you guys down the road somewhere sometime. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye.